Hi, and thank you for joining me for another video. And friends, today we have the grand opportunity of beginning the Torah. And friends, one of the first questions we must ask as we dive in is why does the Torah, our book of instruction, begin with the account of creation? And friends, this is a question that in my opinion, the Mephorshim, the commentators, have not answered properly. Because honestly, how one understands Bereshit and the story of creation is really a litmus test to how they will understand the whole Torah. Dividing us into two groups. Those that believe that the Torah was given for the betterment of the Jew alone and those who believe that it was given for the betterment of all mankind. Because honestly, many of the Midrashim that people live by nowadays regarding these six prakim tell an ethnocentric view of not only the creation story but of Torah in general. And I really should make a video on the way that Midrashim play in our theology and how we develop our doctrines, which is honestly virtually in no way, in none, it's not applicable. And especially when anything tries to skew the underlying message that you will find Parsha after Parsha in these five books. And that's that the Torah, these five books of instructions, not only were given for the benefits or the betterment of some men, but of all men. And friends, once this is understood, you will realize that not just creation, but the whole book of Bereshit was above all else meant to be a slap in the face to the idolatrous and the polytheistic beliefs of the time which above all else was the model that influenced and carried the world's ethical standards to the later generations. So here in the first chapter of the creation story, the text really tries to minimize the act of creation itself. Why? Because this has never been a competition of special effects and on a, who could wow the reader into believing something. No, my friends. Because in that sense, if the wow factor was the key, then some pagan society could just select the George Lucas equivalent of their time to write and direct their creation story. In other words, friends, our God is the true God, and this Torah is the pinnacle of ethical excellence only, only because the ideas contained within it are superior, not because of acts of wonders that anyone can claim. For example, I've even seen Christians walk around stating that the validity of their whole gospel stands and falls on whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Did you hear what I just said? Not because of ideas or some ethical plan for humanity, but some flimsy supposed resurrection story, which if you study pagan mythology could be easily outdone by weightier and more eclectic narratives. Friends, not only in areas of ethical monotheism, but especially in anything demanding you to believe X so that you can produce Y, you must always remember that concept is king. For example, ancient pagan beliefs taught that creation itself, or the power to create, or in turn destroy, is what made a deity worthy of worship. I mean, if you believe that the world was being sustained on the shoulders of Atlas or on the back of a turtle, and your only standard or morality was based on survival alone, you would also worship these false gods. Which is why this text took all the lore and all the luster the pagan world mustered up to justify its actions and dumbed it down to mere speech. And worse, made the whole purpose of creation man and the betterment of man itself. Itself. Um, unlike in the pagan world where man was a being that was tolerated by creation and its creator and surely surely not its purpose which is why man felt that they owed or felt that they had to bribe the gods to let them be because man to the gods to the pagan gods were more of a burden than a purpose which is why any midrash that tries to state that the purpose of creation was to include group x and exclude group y in turn you Using this to make group Y believe that creation was not for them and thus should only fear the creator and serve group X is teaching you lies my friends and just falling into the same trap that the pagan world fell into in confusing their will for Hashem's will failing to struggle against the natural or what comes natural really nothing more than fighting against the human condition which is why nowadays you have people choosing religion and God the way the secular world chooses a spouse either by following an abuse of God or in terms of atheism one who is non-existent which I guess would be equivalent to deciding to 
remain single. But no, friends, the central figure in this whole Parsha is not the creator, but the created. You and I, my friends. Why? Because the Almighty didn't need this. He, he doesn't need this world. He exists outside of time and space. No, friends, the only reason this whole narrative of creation is here is, one, to teach us to remain productive by giving us a weekly model to emulate. I mean... From here is where we get the Sabbath day and how we keep the Sabbath day and how we should work for six days and rest on the seventh. And two, to help us move on and focus on bigger things. And that's it, my friends. And really, that's all. And then, my friends, the Parsha goes on to speak about Adam and Chava, in a way, bringing us down after just telling us that we were the center of creation. Now... I really don't care, and I don't think the text really cares who came first or who came last or who compelled who to eat from the tree or whether women are more evolved than men. Or even in terms of the Parsha, why the Torah begins with a bet or gematria. Friends, all these distractions exist in Jewish life only to keep us from taking what's here and acting on it. And you're probably thinking, why would anything want to distract us from being ethically active and relevant in the world? And friends... I think the answer is simple. Why? Because in the past, rallying the Jews up to take any action in spreading Torah, being any type of light to the world, would only have been met with an undesirable outcome by our host countries. And today, the badness continues less by setting any type of standard. We come to upset secular, irreligious Jews who, in most cases, are the ones who actually pay the rabbi's salary. So, friends, Thank God we live in a place and a time where the Jews are not only not muzzled, but are actually treated roughly by many of the world's inhabitants because of how historically we've suffered for Torah. Clearly, in my opinion, my friends, an opportunity by the Almighty to increase the number of Torah-observant Jews through conversion. Adding to the final piece of this whole puzzle that began right here in Parashat Bereshit. In other words, friends, here the Torah in its inception is showing us that just as through disobedience humanity fell, it will be through obedience that it will be redeemed. Which is a notion that we will see reiterated Parsha after Parsha to come. And my friends, it could be broken down in a very simple way. The whole Torah. Do good, get good. If you fall, get back up. And what's good? Torah is good. And Torah ultimately means nothing if you don't spread it. Because it's a no-brainer. We have to share this planet with others. And friends, this is really a concept I want you to look out for as you study these partials in the coming weeks. The notion that non-Jew after non-Jew all through the Torah continually get punished over and over again for things that do not fall under the laws of Noah. For example, can you tell me that apart from the actual murder, what was Cain's sin according to the laws of Noah? I mean, was not hating his brother one of the laws of Noah? Of course not. And actually, many modern day rabbis have gone as far as to say that there are actually 70 laws of Noah instead of just seven. A notion that by the way, it's not halachic. Why? Because instead of just using common sense and understanding that the ideal for all humanity since creation was only for them to live up to or close to the laws that were later to be given on Mount Sinai, they have instead come up with the boneheaded idea that the Torah and all its ethical edicts were never expected to be kept by the non-Jewish world. Do you hear what I just said? A notion that they really should remember the next time the non-Jewish world comes banging at their door. Friends, from the outset, from this Parsha, humanity was always held accountable for not living up to the Torah, even though it wasn't given yet. I mean, this is what the Torah is telling us. And this is an idea that one could hold without tossing out the Shiva Mitzvot. How? By, friends, by understanding the Zion Mitzvot for what they were truly meant to be. And that's only the bare minimum that distinguishes us from the animal, but definitely, definitely not the standard that we should aspire to, which, my friends, is nothing less than full Torah Judaism. Remember that the next time you hear someone say something like, non-Jews could do X because they're not Jewish. I actually remember how some lady once told me when a non-Jewish girl appeared to my Shabbat table in modestly dressed, stating that, oh, well, it's okay because she's not Jewish. <sighs> <laughs> and again, friends, the reason this is relevant here and for the many other parashiot to come is that the individuals you will read about here were not Hebrews and were also not in the covenant of Abraham yet. And my friends, 
I've said it before and I'll say it again. You do not need Mephorshim to understand the essence and the ethical precepts of the Torah and anything that feels that it knows best and begins to add or to change what's already here only ends up corrupting and diluting the source. And friends, if you're hearing me today and you're looking for a more deeper, a more powerful relationship with the Almighty, I want to welcome and encourage you to consider Torah Judaism, to become a Jew through conversion. For more information on converting to Judaism, please visit doordea.com. Thank you.